welcome to Sunday services with Kaiser Christian Church, uh, and welcome back into this worship space this first week uh, after our Easter celebration uh, as we participated together uh, watching our uh, Disciples General Church Easter worship offering last week. It's good to be with you again uh, in this time and place as we gather to worship together. Let us start our time with some praise songs. to join me in reciting together the call to worship. Come into presence, God's presence with joy. In God we have an inheritance that is imperishable. Come into God's presence with hope. In Christ we have an inheritance that cannot be defiled. Come into God's presence with longing. In the Spirit, we have an inheritance that never fades. Come into God's presence with love. In God, we have an inheritance that brings new life. 
Will you pray with me? God of signs and wonders, breathe new life into us this day, that our spirits may awaken to the joy and the hope of our glorious inheritance through the living Christ. Clear our vision, Holy One, that we may see the promise of Easter in the stirrings of this precious earth, in the life energy flowing through our bodies. Help us find the faith to believe where we have not seen, that others may see in our living and our loving the glory of the risen Christ. Amen. Let us continue now to praise and worship God together as we sing.
For those of you at home who have birthdays in the month of April, we want to celebrate you this time by singing happy birthday on this birthday Sunday. With that, we come to the time in our service where we share and lift up our blessings and concerns to God in prayer. So I invite you um, at this time to reflect on those things in the past week or two that have been a particular blessing to you, a phone call from a friend, a letter in the mail, an uplifting story that you have read. Some element of being reached out to, and also those concerns that you have, which we know can be many. I have one blessing that I would like to share with all of you this morning to begin this time. Um, it takes a lot of work and time and special skill to put together, especially in short notice, uh, a service like this online, making that transition from in-person worship that we're all so used to, to this um, different sort of way of communicating, this different venue. And I want to lift up as a blessing those people who have contributed to that effort with Kaiser Christian Church. Uh, Elizabeth, who leads us in music. Paul, who is handling our technology and um, keeps us in the communicating with you in the best way possible. And, runs all the wires and pushes the buttons and makes it all look good. Uh, we appreciate you. And uh, Gary, who um, decorates the sanctuary for us and keeps things beautiful uh, for you at home. For Lori in the office, who prints out all of our paper and, and makes sure all of the postings for online access and our Facebook feed get out to all of you so that you know what's happening and how to get connected. And also our praise band who were with us for the first couple of weeks and we hope to have them with us again soon, offering their musical talents. Thank you to all of you for the blessings that you give each of us in offering this service of worship for you all at home. Let us take some time in silence now as we reflect on our blessings and concerns, as we lift them to God. Holy God, we come into your holy presence this Sunday morning, bearing on our shoulders and in our hearts and minds all the ways that you breathe life into us, the blessings that you bestow upon us, both seen and unseen, those that we are immediately aware of and those that it takes time for us to notice. We lift up our thanksgiving to you this day for all of those. We lift up our thanksgiving for the fact that you are a God with us. You are a God of comfort. You are a God of healing in the midst of trial. You are a God who hears our lament who knows our innermost being. You, God, know our blessing and concern before we know them ourselves. You know our prayers. You hear them. And you respond.
Lord, those of us in this place and those worshiping together at home this morning, praise you. Ask your presence with us, continuing with us. Comforting us. Healing us. For this was your goal when you sent your Son into the world to show us the way, to bring blessing and joy and comfort and healing to broken people. Let us pray now in the manner that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, glory forever. Amen. We would like to share with you another encouraging video message from our general minister and president, Reverend Terry Hoard Owens. I think sometime each day to allow the presence of God to simply envelop you. Hello disciples, happy Eastertide. I was so grateful to be able to share with so many of you as we celebrated this Easter unlike any that we've ever experienced in our lifetimes. But the power of the resurrection and new life in Christ was proclaimed. Thanks be to God. Well, we've been in this sheltering at home season for a little more than a month now, and I just wanna check in on you. How are you? We all recognize that we're dealing with a lot right now. Many of us are getting stir crazy and the anxiety of not knowing when this is going to end is starting to take its toll. Many of us are finding that loved ones and friends are contracting the COVID-19 virus and sadly too many of us are losing loved ones to the virus. Experts tell us that it's okay to recognize and acknowledge that we're dealing with a lot it's okay to take time for rest. It's okay to lament, to grieve. It's okay to laugh. I've been scheduling time for myself, away from the Zoom screens, time for rest, and I've begun a 40-day prayer retreat to deepen my own spiritual discipline. I believe that we can ask God for lots of things, but we also need to sit still and experience the presence of God, to pause, breathe, and feel God's presence. I invite you to join me not only in taking a praise break, but spending some time each day to allow the presence of God to simply envelop you. I know that if you ask God to show up, God will. Be well, be safe, be gentle with yourself. As Psalm 16 tells us, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Owens, for continuing to offer those encouraging messages each Friday afternoon. I invite you at home uh, to join me in a time of blessing now as we uh, 
praying a blessing over our young ones this morning. Holy God, we know that each of us is struggling with staying home, with the realities of what it takes to keep our neighbors and loved ones safe during this time. We know especially that it can be a confusing time for our young ones as we endeavor to explain to them the realities of our current situation and find the words and the ability to comfort them and keep them entertained and healthy both in mind and body and spirit. We ask your particular blessing upon them this morning, God, that they would know your love and your care, that you are with each and every one of them, that you bestow your blessings upon them, you breathe your life into them. May they have joy each and every day. Amen. So, for our message this morning, we uh, remember that this is the first week after Easter, our Easter celebration, and that we continue to remember and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus during this time, which we call Easter Tide. We, we often forget that Easter is not just one Sunday out of the year, but it in fact ushers in uh, a short season called Eastertide, traditionally in the church, and that this is a time where we continue that celebration and remembrance of what it means to follow a resurrected, a risen Savior. For those of us that follow the church calendar and the lectionary calendar, as I do, Sometimes it feels like the, the scriptures that, that come up each week, and there is often there's a, a selection to, to choose from, but sometimes it is a, a struggle to figure out what is God saying to our community in these words, in this time and place. And, and there are other weeks like this one where the passage seems particularly poignant or connected to current events. And, and for this week, the passage from 1 Peter, I think, is, is one of those passages. It's one of those instances where reading it in preparation for this week, it just struck a chord with me, and I think it will with you as well. If you'll turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and let's read it together. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's 
let's take some time to kind of walk through this passage and see in these few short verses what the author of 1 Peter packs into such a small package. He begins with a declaration of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He continues on reminding us of that inheritance that all people of faith have. The part that struck me particularly this week in verse 6. In this you rejoice even if for now, if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. And we all feel a little bit like that right now, going through some kind of trial, a test, a hardship, not necessarily knowing fully what the purpose may be or what the outcome may be. What are we going to be after this? Next, the author of 1 Peter reminds us that our faith is tested and grown and strengthened through trial. Developing into honor and glory to God. Through our trials, our faith can be strengthened and in turn eventually produces joy, which as we all know is not the same as happiness we're not always happy with the trials that we engage in and, and suffer through in life. But it oftentimes does produce a sense of joy, of accomplishment, of knowing and looking back and seeing where God was with us along the way. And so our faith deepens and grows and strengthens. And finally, in verse 9, we are reminded of the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our soul, literally our whole self, not just in a spiritual sense, but when the author here says soul, he means all of you, your entire being, receiving salvation, not received, not past tense, not once before, but right now. This is an active thing. The author of this passage reminds us that we have faith without physically seeing Jesus. There is this idea inherent in the passage that there are other powerful ways to be present with one another. This idea of having not seen Christ, but loving him. Even though we do not see him in body, now we believe in him. This idea comes from, in part, the book of John, which we'll look at next. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. This is the story of Jesus appearing to the disciples and subsequently to Thomas, who was not with them at that first appearing. The evangelist says, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, Sunday, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear, the Jews Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Now a few things we need to point out in this passage. At first when the scene is described of the disciples being locked away in the room, it in no way is explicit that it is only the eleven four disciples remaining. It is in fact most likely many others, except Thomas of course in the first scene of this passage. Now they were, in fact, locked away in, in the house where they had met. Our Bibles say, for fear of the Jews. Now, we need to be specific here and understand that those were the Jewish authorities that they were afraid of. Not the entire Jewish people as a whole. And that has been a mistake we have made throughout history in our interpretation. It is important for us to recognize that it is only the Jewish authorities that are being spoken of here. A very specific, small group within an entire society. And that through Jesus' gift of peace, that fear ebbs away in the course of the story. The first thing that Jesus does upon appearing in the midst of the disciples in this locked room is offer his peace. And he repeats it, peace be with you. Now here, the most important thing to remember about this passage because classically we have often interpreted this and, and thought of Thomas as the doubter. The doubting Thomas is one of the, the prime images from this passage that, that we grew up thinking about and that we took away from this passage. And that even as our English translations use the words in the New International Version and the New Revised Standard Version say, Jesus tells him, do not doubt, but believe. But in actuality, what Jesus is saying, he uses the same word for belief. It would more accurately be described as saying, don't unbelieve, but believe. See the difference? Doubting is an active, almost combative approach. To something in life, something you hear or are told about. Thomas isn't doing that here. Not with Jesus, anyway. He may be a doubter of the disciples 
account. Which in fact makes him no different than the disciples themselves who doubted Mary just the day before. And you may say, well, what about Thomas's demands of putting his finger and hand in the wounds of Jesus? Well, his language may have been more forceful, but he is in fact asking for no more or less than the disciples have already received themselves. Having not been there at that first appearing of Jesus, Thomas is simply saying, I'm not sure about what you say. We've been through so much in the last short few days. We've been traumatized. I don't know if I can trust your account, that of the other disciples. And so he wants to see and witness the same thing that they profess to have already done. He wants to have that same experience, an intimate, visceral experience with his teacher, with Jesus, the Messiah. And how can we fault him for that? Don't we all wish for the same? And so Thomas has often gotten a bad rap. And I think if we really look at his character and what he's asking for and, and what happens, if we are more like him, and not in a negative light, but we are more like him than we have heretofore realized. Thomas only wants the same as the disciples have already gotten. And so Jesus shows up for Thomas. He offers his whole self to him, invites him to do as he had asked, fulfills the demands of Thomas's criteria for belief. He, in fact, through that shows us that the timing of coming to believe in faith has no bearing on the level of blessing. And if we had any question about that truth, Jesus goes on explicitly to say to Thomas, not in a sarcastic or pointed way, have you believed because you have seen me? He wants to make sure that Thomas has gotten what he needs, just as the disciples already had, in order to come to a full belief and faith in who Jesus is. And he goes on to say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. And that's for us. That's for all future generations. Jesus extends this truth of the timing of coming to faith and seeing or not seeing. Jesus says, First Peter reminds the people later on that we've already heard. We don't have to physically see Jesus in corporeal body in order to believe. We receive that same blessing thousands of years later that those first disciples received the peace of Christ, the inbreathing of God's Spirit. That is offered to each of us. And here is where we can lift up Thomas the most. Thomas's response. This is where we can be clued into the fact that Thomas is not the doubting Thomas of classic understanding he is not to be put down and discouraged as being unfaithful because his response belies any belief in that character flaw. Thomas responds to Jesus' offering of his whole self with the most pointed and explicit declaration of faith and who and what Jesus actually is. He says, my Lord and my God. He declares Jesus as Messiah, as ruler of his life, his heart, and as God incarnate. My God. With those few short words, Thomas makes the most explicit and definitive declaration of faith in the entire gospel. Doubting Thomas? Don't think so. Now, 
Jesus offers his whole self to Thomas to reach out and touch. There is no indication that Thomas actually does so. The words and actions of Jesus were enough to inspire Thomas's faith and belief. Now, we are invited into this story the same way. The same as Thomas and the other disciples, Jesus has offered his whole self, mind, body, and spirit for every one of us. That's what we remembered last week on Easter and continue to remember what Jesus did on that cross. He put his whole self up there for us. Save our souls, or as First Peter says, our whole selves. He gave of his whole self for our whole self. And we invited likewise. We are invited likewise to offer ourselves, our whole selves, as the body of Christ in the world to inspire people to faith. Even in times such as these, when we are not able to be physically present with one another, we must remember, as 1 Peter reminds us, in talking about being seen and unseen, having belief without seeing with our eyes, we must remember that there are other powerful ways to be present for one another. Amen. As we continue in response to that invitation to reach out and touch one another in any way that we can imagine, especially in this time where we cannot be physically present with one another. Continue to seek ways to reach out and touch each other with God's love as believing people, inspiring belief in one another. And continue our time together with our hymn of response, number 260, in the child's hymnal, Let It Breathe On Me. For people living in the Northern Hemisphere, this is a time of spring coming. Tiptoeing into our awareness, one blossom at a time, or full-blown greening of the grass, trees, bushes, as the heat increases, and people are drawn outside to the wonders of azure blue skies and golden sun. All that life emerging often serves to encourage us, especially if we've had a hard winter or been inside under COVID restrictions. 
Not even a beautiful spring, however, can compare to the gift we've been given in Jesus. Raised up from death to new life. In the Gospel of John, the writer details the purpose of writing this book. These are written so you may come to believe Jesus is the Messiah. And through believing, you may have life in his name. Our full life comes as we believe. And part of that life is our own overflowing spirit of gratitude, which leads us to respond with further signs of life. So today we offer symbols of our full life. For those like us now worshiping online together, our offerings may come in the form of contributions via our Kaiser Christian Church website or the cell phone app or a check mailed to the church. They may also come in taking time to call and encourage others in our congregation or outside our congregation, people you know and love. They may come in creating cards of thanks to surprise your minister or music director or tech volunteer or office manager or any number of people who contribute to the life and ministry of this congregation. They may come in myriad ways. You are bound by nothing less than your own imagination. However, you are able to demonstrate your gratitude for the amazing gift of being a resurrection person. Let us join in making our offering now today. Living God, we thank you for the most amazing gift of Jesus, raised from the dead. In joy, we celebrate the gift of your Holy Spirit, alive and at work in us and in your world. So receive these gifts and receive our gratitude as we seek to live fully the life you give us today. Amen. We find ourselves once again gathered around this table. Now, of course, you must be saying to yourselves, well, Pastor Eric, we're not around the table. This feels different. We are removed. We are not in the place we feel like we should be on Sunday morning. And while that is true, what is also true is that no matter how far we must physically distance ourselves, where we find ourselves, whether we're at home, sheltering in place, around a different looking table, or a card table, or a plate on our laps, or whether we find ourselves in this sanctuary that is so familiar around this physical table that we are so used to seeing. As the scripture today reminds us, physical proximity and actual seeing has no particular bearing on our faith or belief. We are encouraged to recognize the spiritual truth that no matter where we physically find ourselves, we are gathered around this table in faith and belief because this table is the one that Christ himself has given us 
not this physical table, but the one that he breathed into us as he breathed into those disciples in that locked room. The gift of the table is something we hold within each of us, and so no amount of distance can take that connection away. For that amazing gift, we can be truly thankful as we remember the importance of this table. We remember as Easter people the sacrifice made to heal us, to bring us together, to show us the way. Jesus came into the disciples' midst and offered himself he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it for them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat it, you remember me. You become my body, Christ, in the world. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and after giving thanks for it, he poured it out for them, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, you remember me. Let us join together now wherever we are at the body of Christ in Holy Communion together.
I remind you for, of some other opportunities to connect and stay connected throughout the week. Uh, immediately following this service, we have a, a Zoom fellowship time uh, that you'll see a slide for at the end of the service. If you're interested in participating in that and have not received the, the login information via email, uh, you can email us at pastorfree at kaiserchristian.org and we'll send that to you for this afternoon. We also have a Zoom-based online Bible study every Thursday at 11 and the same rules apply. You can call or email the office for that login information. And with that, I invite you to join with me in singing our hymn of benediction this morning as we close our worship time together. Reach out and touch the world. Amen.